economies are opening up. To preserve the health of our citizens, we must also preserve the health and functioning of our economy. Despite warnings, opening up too early could have consequences. Ultimately, the virus is going to determine when we really can safely reopen. In this time of crisis, how can investors navigate volatility and uncertainty? We convene the biggest names across finance, economics, and investing to help investors weather the turbulence. We are live in Hong Kong, Dubai, London, and New York for exclusive interviews and smart analysis. This is Bloomberg Invest Global. And a warm welcome to day three of Invest Global from our Middle East headquarters in Dubai. I'm Manus Cranny, the host of Daybreak Middle East, along with Daybreak Europe. We cross the time divide. We bring asset gatherers, asset owners, and risk takers together. Uh, this is the third day. We're traveling around the globe from Asia to the Middle East, to Africa, to Europe, and of course, ending up in the destination, some would say, of most of the capital, that is the United States. We speak to the influential names, as you've seen throughout the day. Another asset owner joining us today. What are the risks? What is volatility? How do you manage volatility in a time of coronavi corona coronavirus? How do you look at risk? How do you manage your business? I want to start by thanking our sponsor for this part of uh, the series. It is Echo Bank uh, for our Middle East and Africa sponsor. Uh, you can hop into uh, the resources section and find out a little bit more about them. Some housekeeping, I'm becoming moderately proficient now with it, to the process to best watch this Invest Global. Use Firefox or Chrome as your browsers. If you've got trouble with the audio, you want to reset the video quality, please do so. Just refresh your browser, restore the windows, use the buttons at the bottom of the screen, and they're all adjustable. You can have more of my guests, less of me, whatever it is that, that you prefer. It's an interactive event. Ask the questions. That is the differentiator. There's a Q&A button. Join it. Click on it. Click Submit. I will pass the questions along. We will have a poll question. Uh, never far from a poll here. And... Um, we will do that. So that's going to be on the right-hand side of your screen. We've got a hashtag. It's hashtag Bloomberg Invest. Join us there. So without any further ado, that's all the housekeeping done. It is Yves Perrier, Chief Executive Officer of Amundi. This gentleman owns a few assets. Eve, great to have you with us today. Look forward to this, this next portion of the conversation. So you join me on day three, and the narrative from Schwartzman to Ackman they talk about normalization, V-shaped recovery. What is your perspective? Markets are rebounding, but you say we're far from recovery. Good day, sir. Give me the e take out of Monday. Um, firstly, uh, uh, we have uh, to assess some points. The first uh, point is that this crisis uh, is probably one of the worst uh, crisis that uh, we experience uh, since uh, the Second World War, because uh, it's a crisis which affects uh, all uh, the countries. And uh, uh, the, um, uh, we, we have still a lot of uh, incertitude of its impact on uh, the real economy. The first point is uh, our capacity to control uh, this uh, uh, epidemic. In many countries, uh, and especially in Latin America, but also countries like uh, India, uh, the epidemic is growing. That's the first incertitude. The second incertitude is uh, uh, the impact it will have uh, uh, on the economy. The question of uh, 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 the uh, uh, recovery or uh, uh, L or uh, and so on. Our view is the fact that uh, uh, it will be only on 2020 that uh, the global GDP of most of the country will come back to, to, to the GDP uh, prior to crisis, that means the GDP of uh, 2019. And the evolution of the market uh, in this period, uh, in reality, has been completely driven by the strong reaction of central banks. Uh, central banks, all central banks, the Fed, the ECB, but the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, has ejected mm. a tremendous amount 
of liquidity on the market. And so this rebound uh, of the market for us is mainly driven by liquidity. And the incertitude is uh, 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 the, the fact that uh, it anticipates uh, a strong rebound of the economy, but uh, uh, there is a lot, at the minimum, a lot of incertitude of uh, this strong uh, uh, rebound of uh, uh, economy. And in our view, it's uh, uh, overestimating the pace of this uh, rebound. And uh, okay. uh, so, if the, we're addicted, if, if if we're addicted to central, if we're addicted to central banks, that's part of the narrative. Some people are saying to me, we have the Fed put with all the central banks flushing the system with liquidity. If I was to say to you then, these fast rebound in equities, the compression in credit spreads, is it American equities and credit spreads globally that perhaps are elevated? Do you, do you worry that we've gone too far, too fast? Um, it's, uh, it's a global uh, impact, uh, of course, of uh, 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 American US uh, equities, which has uh, come back to their level of the end of 2019, but also uh, of Euron equities. And if I look at the spreads, uh, the spreads now, for example, in Europe, are the same uh, on credit, are the same as the spread uh, before uh, uh, the, 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 the crisis. And uh, uh, the, the danger can be that uh, we'll see, for example, on credit more defaults on the coming period, uh, more uh, uh, rating downgrades and so on, and that the microeconomic view gives uh, a, a different view of the global view uh, uh, that uh, presently uh, the market. That the reason why we we keep, uh, let's say, a, a prudent and very selective view uh, on the way we we invest. Well, we were chatting last week, and you 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 kept saying to me you emphasize liquidity. What does that mean? How, how liquid are your funds? Give me some percentages. What shifts ha have you seen across the business for liquidity and cash? Uh, you know, we manage money for institutional investors and we manage money for uh, uh, individual uh, uh, customers uh, through funds and so on. And uh, the, our main commitment uh, to, uh, uh, to our customers uh, is to ensure the permanent liquidity because it's a daily uh, open fund. And uh, at the beginning of the crisis, uh, I pass uh, the, the the message, uh, which was very simple, was to say we have three main objectives. The first is liquidity, the second is liquidity, and the third is liquidity. And in our fund, we have increased the level of liquidity, which is between 10 and for some funds, 30% of uh, uh, the total amount uh, 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 of the funds. I listened to James Bullard yesterday, uh, veteran of the Fed. He said he doesn't see bubbles. He doesn't see bubbles like it was, you will remember well, the tech bubble that blew up. I mean, you and I will remember LTCM. You and I will go back a few historical moments before the 2000 stock market bubble. He doesn't see bubbles of, this, of the tech bubble. He doesn't see a housing bubble. Do you see any bubbles? And I know it's always hard to predict them, but what worries you the most in markets? But, you know, when we are speaking of bubble, we are speaking of, uh, you know, some assets uh, which has a, a, a real uh, too high valuation. The, the reality is the valuation of, uh, uh, of an asset uh, is depending on different factors, but one key factor is uh, the level of uh, interest rate. And uh, so if we consider that this in low uh, interest rate are uh, to, to be maintained uh, for the whole life, we have no bubbles. But if we consider that uh, at a time, uh, which come, we don't know why, but uh, at a time, there is an increase of interest rate, at this time, all asset classes are overvalued. Uh, uh, and so, you know, permanently, it was before the crisis, uh, I was saying that as an investor, uh, when we were looking to the growth, we were optimistic on valuation, but looking at the level of debt, we were 
uh, pessimistic. And since this crisis, what we see, we see two factors, decrease in growth at the minimum, or uh, stabilization of growth yep. for a long time, and we see a huge amount of debt, uh, uh, public debt, uh, corporate debt, uh, and so on. So we are in a situation where we are, the market is completely dependent of the policy of central banks, which in fact determine the level of interest rate, but at the same time, central banks are dependent on the view of the market uh, about this. And so it's... Uh, Some well, Bullard, Bullard which is, would say that they've been very, very clear in the US with their forward guidance, Eve, in terms of low for longer. They have the credibility and the credibility that they established in 2008 is with them. Do you believe the narrative and the market does, which is low for very, very long? Let's just square that away and then we'll talk about debt. So first of all, on the rates, are you? do you believe they have credibility at the Fed and the ECB in terms of the guidance they're giving us? Uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, there is, you know, no real alternative uh, to maintain uh, interest rate uh, low because uh, considering the level of debt uh, in the global economy, which has, uh, which had uh, significantly increased in 2008 and which is now significantly increases. Uh, an increase of low interest uh, of interest rate can uh, uh, create a major problem. But at the same time, uh, the divergences in between the countries, the region, uh, is in crisis because low interest rate creates also a uh, form of repression to the savers. Uh, and so at the time, for example, for uh, the way to, to pay uh, retirement pension funds and so on. So. Uh, there can be contradiction uh, uh, at some mm -hmm. time between the interest of uh, uh, the uh, the one and the others, which uh, create uh, a, a problem. So, uh, um, to summarize, I would say, by a certain extent, we can be confident because there is no alternative. But looking at the same time, what happens in case of increase? it will be a, a major problem for the markets. Okay, that could certainly cause a, a major debt re-rating. Okay, I just want to ask our audience a, a poll question here, and then you and I can, we can have a look at the results of it, because it's about the risks for the rest of the year, and there, there are many. If it's not the US election, it's a hard Brexit, it's a whole variety. But here we go, we focused in on China, so let me just ask the audience um, the question, which is what's next for the US-China trade deal? A, phase one trade deal will move ahead, B, parameters of the trade deal will be changed and agreed. C, the US will pull out of the trade deal. And D, China will pull out of the trade deal. I suppose, Eve, if you're watching your Bloomberg yesterday morning, I know you do every morning, you would have seen the Navarro comment, you were up early with me. And we saw the market really whip around on, on just a few little words. So let's get these poll, let's get these uh, poll results in. And I have got to just do something technical, technology. There we go. So the, the results, let's just focus on this because it's interesting. We've got, nobody thinks China's going to pull out of the deal. Be brave, somebody out there, click. Um, but 45% believe, Eve, that the trade deal will be changed and it will be agreed. So that's the consensus. 45%, 33% believe that the trade deal will move ahead. So we're, we're, at, we're at 78% that we're going to get up and over the line in some format. Does that make sense to you? Well, my, my, my view is uh, the, the following. You know, a crisis, uh, in fact, for me, it's uh, uh, an accelerator of uh, uh, evolution or uh, transformation. I, I don't believe to a new world. Uh, uh, I believe to uh, uh, the acceleration of what was happening before. And what was happening before? is the fact that uh, uh, China, uh, 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 which was a, a partner for uh, the US for a long time, since the beginning of the 80s, uh, 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 has become a rival from the US, first point. Second point, China uh, has begun to uh, reorientate uh, its economy more uh, to internal demand than uh, uh, to export. And so what we will see 
is a permanent uh, uh, conflict or debate between uh, China and the US for the next uh, 30 years. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, I think that there are mutual interests between uh, uh, the two uh, uh, countries and uh, uh, that permanently we will have uh, 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 you know, uh, walk to an agreement, but at the same time, a new uh, debate and so on. We have to live in a world which will be different. It's a world where each region, each big country uh, uh, is uh, playing uh, uh, his game. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a world which is multilateral, de facto, and uh, we will have to live uh, with this. The importance not only of that trade deal, but of some more stability on trade for the flow and allocation of capital. How important is that trade deal or that anxiety around trade and Sino-US relations for allocation to China and to emerging markets, Steve? Um, I don't put, uh, you know, uh, a lot of importance uh, to this question of uh, trade deal or not, because uh, there are mutual interests between uh, 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 the US and China, but permanently uh, they will uh, try to take it uh, uh, at uh, their uh, advantage. And for uh, emerging market, what is a bit different is that the, the huge amount of liquidity which has been injected, part of this, is going to emerging market and it's this is uh, favorable for them when you see the number of rate cuts from not just the developed markets but from emerging markets it's an interesting time isn't it we've got quantitative easing unlimited quantitative easing, quantitative easing in developed markets but th this whole new wave of rate cuts in emerging markets it, it is the new phenomena in this crisis isn't it Yes, yes, uh, it's one of uh, uh, the, the, the feature, the, the, the answer which is given, uh, which is uh, new. Uh, at the same time, it can create uh, new uh, unbalances, especially for uh, uh, the countries who have uh, a problem of uh, uh, balance of payments, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Turkey, mm -hmm. and uh, we can have some... Uh, 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 currency uh, crisis uh, for some of these countries because they are very dependent on the inflows or outflows uh, 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 for uh, 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 for their balance of payments. Indeed, um, and I suppose that all ties back to, to the dollar. But let's let's talk about you as an asset owner and, and the deployment. We caught up with Mr. Schwartzman and he talked about. Blackstone being aggressively looking to put some of our 150 billion US dollars of dry powder to use. Are you in the same mode? Are the discussions inside a Monday about deployment? You said to me, Manus, we're building liquidity and we're between 10 and 30% on, on the cash side. You don't get you don't get a round of applause from institutional investors for cash. So give me a sense of the scale of deployment, that scale of money that you want to deploy. And are you in aggressive searching mode for assets? Um, uh, we are uh, uh, very present in what we call real assets. I mean, uh, real estate, uh, uh, private debt, uh, 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 some private uh, equity funds. Uh, we manage, uh, we are not that big, but we manage uh, around 50 billion euros on this uh, real asset. We consider, uh, and we were before on this because we uh, were able to catch uh, the liquidity premium, uh, the yield of these assets uh, benefit from uh, uh, their uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, liquidity. We consider that in the present situation, uh, these uh, assets uh, are uh, uh, a good uh, way of uh, invest. I won't say we will be aggressive, uh, but we continue to deploy uh, this, uh, uh, our investment in this asset and to promote, uh, uh, for example, our real estate funds, uh, which have a, a, a yield of uh, 4%, uh, which is a good yield uh, in, in the present period. But we have to be also prudent 
because if I take uh, private equity before the crisis, uh, 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 mm-hmm. you could have you know, uh, 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 a non-listed company uh, with a valuation uh, 30% higher than a listing uh, company. That means that the liquidity premium was negative. Uh, but at the same time, generally, as investors are on a long-term view, you have not to manage the liquidity in these funds. Uh, you can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, more, uh, uh, um, it's, uh, to have a more long-term uh, approach. But being aggressive is not for me the good qualification for the present time. I would say that uh, the global qualification of our investment policy is uh, prudence and then selectivity. Okay, I suppose it, it's a it's a lovely differential, isn't it, between between two sides of the Atlantic? It's about deployment as opposed as opposed to aggressively aggressively searching. Can I dig a little bit more into the real estate side? Um, because I I, I want to get your take. There, there is this debate that we're going to need less of these floors. You're going to need less of the floors that you are in. That that's one of the debates in the commercial property world in a post-COVID world. Do you think that's the way it's going to run? Do you think there's going to be a dissipation in terms of the amount of commercial property space that we need and that we use? Uh, which are the, the lessons of uh, this uh, operational experience of uh, uh, COVID-19? Um, during three months, uh, we were able to work uh, at 100%, uh, to be operational uh, at 100% with uh, more than 95% uh, working uh, uh, remotely. Uh, so uh, uh, we have made the demonstration that we, we, we can use this uh, way of working. At the same time, uh, for me, uh, 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 there is something which is very important. It's the social cohesion. If for Amundi we have been uh, uh, able to work uh, uh, you know, successfully uh, during the COVID, it was due to two main factors. The first was uh, the uh, robustness of uh, our IT platform, and the second was the commitment of the people and the social cohesion. So our view uh, today is uh, to come back to normality with, uh, uh, at the end of this month, so 100% of the people of Amundi will have come back uh, at home. At the same time, we will increase uh, remote working, uh, you know, in the normal uh, uh, life of the company. But uh, at the same what time, what sort of percentage will... do you think will work remotely, Eve? If you bring everybody back, but you let them have a little bit more flexibility, what is that? Is that ten percent can work remotely? Twenty percent can work remotely? What What's your estimate? You know, we will discuss this with uh, uh, our uh, trade unions in the coming period, but my idea is one or two days, and especially for the people who are living uh, 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 far from uh, the office. But at the same time, we will uh, uh, change our office to make them more convenient, more friendly uh, uh, for the people, because I consider that the normal location is uh, the office. And uh, when some people are saying, we will uh, reduce uh, the number of uh, square meters for the people thanks mm. to the experience, I have another view, which is the following. First, the normal location is the office. We have to make it convenient with more room, more uh, individual space, because the people, you know, have a cost which is uh, really higher than the score meters. What we have to optimize is, uh, you know, the efficiency of the people. Uh, it's really more important than the cost of the score meters. Okay, and that's a very, very. It's, it's interesting how I think different businesses would probably have different have different interpretation on this, whether you're tech, asset management, um, but economies getting back to work, getting economies going again. How will Amundi participate in that? Are, are, you said, Manus, I'm going to be, and I'm paraphrasing, is that you're going to be judicious in the deployment of capital. I'm going to be careful about the deployment of capital. But getting involved in economies and recapitalizing economies, 
How are you going to do that? How are you going to participate in that, Eve? Uh, by, by two ways. The, we have begun, for example, uh, with uh, uh, our um, private debt funds. You know that, uh, for example, in France, uh, there, there are uh, special loans uh, granted by the state, which has been uh, 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 granted to uh, companies or uh, SMEs in order to, to, to give them the possibility uh, to go through uh, this uh, uh, exceptional period. And uh, restructuring this debt uh, in our fund of uh, debt, we have uh, taken an attitude, which is, of course, to continue to uh, to take the financial criteria and to protect uh, our investors, but at the same time to participate to this global restructuring. Uh, on the other side, we will launch uh, equity uh, private equity funds uh, in order to replace this additional debt by uh, equity or mezzanine debt uh, after the, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the coming to the end of this exceptional uh, loans uh, granted. So it's a way by reinforcing uh, the capital structure of uh, companies uh, to participate uh, to, uh, uh, to um, the solution. Uh, of this crisis. Can I ask you, I, I, did you panic at all in the past three months? Did you? Did you panic? Uh, did no. you have a moment of, my gosh, I, 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 I'm very unsure what, what, what to do next? Was there a moment of, of shock? Uh, maybe, you know, I have um, uh, uh, an advantage uh, which has to to has gone through many crises in my professional uh, uh, careers and uh, of course the 2008 the 2000 uh, uh, crisis uh, the 2011 uh, uh, crisis of uh, 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 debt in Europe and uh, in the past I, I joined the banking industry at the time of the Latin American crisis of uh, the end of the 80s at, uh, after you had the Brady, uh, Pla Brady Bonds plan and so on and so on. So uh, firstly, uh, when you are uh, experienced, it's uh, an advantage. The second point, uh, I've always considered that uh, uh, we were uh, in a global context uh, uh, where a crisis can come, excess of debt uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, um, uh, also, we have, uh, you know, the, uh, in Amundi, have uh, the, the luck to have a very good uh, management team. And uh, uh, for us, it was uh, a mm -hmm. problem to address. Uh, uh, it creates stress, but panic not. No. You've mentioned debt a couple of times. Um, debt is the solution. Central banks are the solution. Debt is the solution. Is that is that is that the red warning sign for you that the, the debt risk and if so is that more about America than it is about Europe? What is the concerns you so Eve, about debt? You know, the, firstly, uh, uh, I consider that the uh, 2008 crisis was a result of an excess uh, of debt. The solution has been to add more debt. The solution today is to add more debt. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, one answer can be that uh, central banks can uh, create uh, uh, money uh, uh, for uh, permanently and so on. I don't think uh, it's, uh, when you look at the history, the long time history, that uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it can last for, uh, uh, for, uh, for the whole life. And so uh, the concern is the way we uh, find uh, uh, an economy which uh, has enough growth uh, to uh, 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 reduce uh, this level of debt or at the minimum to stop its growth, to stop. It's gross. 
because one day sí. there will be a problem. Well, one day, one day, and this is a shocking fact, one day you have to deal with the debt, don't you? One, one day you actually have to repay the debt and that, that might become more expensive. Can, can we focus in on, on, some, on some of the position? I've had a lot of debate that the, the, the Fed and the ECB have crowded out um, institutions like yours, in other words, making it more difficult for institutions like yours to find good opportunities. What do you say to that? No, it's it's a matter of fact that uh, the the market is driven uh, by uh, uh, the action of central bank you know, uh, today, uh, and that means that uh, uh, it uh, uh, creates uh, uh, an undifferentiation on uh, uh, the relative value uh, of uh, the assets, and uh, clearly uh, it makes uh, our job uh, of as investor more difficult uh, than it was in the past because permanently we have to uh, to, to have this bet uh, on uh, what uh, central banks uh, will do. Um, it's interesting in terms of the, the next the next part of the of, of the puzzle is that in your part of the world, isn't it? At the moment, it's all eyes on Europe and the recovery fund, the seven hundred and fifty billion euros. Um, what would that do to the European narrative, Eve? And, and, and how would you allocate? Would you would you allocate more capital to Europe if that comes through? Uh, I think the, 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 uh, when, when you look at Europe or the Eurozone as a whole, it's a strong uh, 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 economy and, uh, uh, you know, the, the level of debt is uh, acceptable. But you have strong divergences, differences between uh, the countries of, of the north, uh, uh, Germany, Austria, Netherlands, and so on, and the country uh, of the south. If you take uh, uh, one figure or two figures, uh, debt to GDP, public debt to GDP of the countries of the north uh, were before the crisis under uh, 60%. And debt to GDP of country of the south were 120 percent. Uh, uh, the countries of the north has budgetary surplus, and the country of the south has a deficit. And so, uh, the key question for Europe is uh, to try to reduce the divergences and to and, and the, in this respect, uh, injecting money uh, with this plan of 750 million euros for the country of the south goes in the good direction. Uh, will mm -hmm. it be efficient? Probably not. Uh, uh, is it rapid enough? Probably not. No, probably, probably not, but it's the good direction. Because central banks can do everything. The monetary policy can do part of the job, but uh, it's very important that the fiscal policy the, the policy of governments accompany what is doing uh, the central banks. There was, you know, we've, we've touched on real estate and the stimulus program for, for Europe. When you look at the second half of this year, Eve, um, I know there are many tail risks. Trade, trade wars, you say you're not too stressed about that. There's the US election coming up. We don't know how that's going to play out exactly. There's also Brexit as well for the United Kingdom and Europe and a new relationship with Europe. Of, of, of those, of that, of that a la carte menu of, of risk in the second half, um, does Brexit feature at all or is it the elections? What is it of, of those lists? What, what concerns you? Well, in fact, for, for the US election, uh, uh, frankly, I have no clear view, firstly, uh, of who will win and uh, the, the, the impact. Uh, and uh, uh, looking at Brexit since the beginning, uh, I consider that uh, there will be, um, you know, uh, some uh, agreement between uh, UK and Europe because uh, uh, the mutual, it's in the mutual interest of uh, 
uh, Europe and uh, UK, uh, this, the two economies are still very uh, in, 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 uh, uh, integrated. Uh, and so uh, I don't see, uh, you know, uh, uh, could, uh, what could be the interest of each part, UK and Europe, not to come to such or such uh, kind of uh, agreement. So I have no real uh, fear. Uh, my, my concern is more uh, uh, about, uh, is not for the second semester, it's more for the, the coming year. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, when and we'll see that uh, the real economy uh, is still uh, uh, lagging uh, compared to what it was uh, in 2019. So we've had the monetary policy response. I mean, I think I was listening to John Micklethwaite and, and um, Manny Roman yesterday from PIMCO, and John was making the point we've had 10 trillion in stimulus so far, you know, in the space of, of one year versus what we had in the whole of 2008 and 2009. If you're concerned about the real economy going into next year, Eve, do you think that we get more central bank? But more importantly, do we get do we get more fiscal stimulus? You say 750 billion might not be in, in, enough. So, what more? What's the next evolution that you can see next year, Eve? Uh, I think that uh, the the answer should be on uh, fiscal uh, stimulus. In fact, to to increase. Uh, uh, the, the, the demand. Uh, the, in fact, what we have to avoid is a combination of uh, a shock on supply uh, by the restructuring of company and a shock of demand. For example, if I take the example of France, uh, uh, the side deposits uh, increased by 60 billion euros. And uh, one of the key points is the fact that uh, uh, consumption uh, resumes uh, and uh, and uh, it will be linked to confidence, in fact, uh, of uh, consumers. So, uh, uh, and I come back to the incertitude about firstly uh, the epidemic. Uh, the, uh, are we sure that uh, at the end? Uh, and the fact that uh, 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 consumers are also uh, uh, managers of companies. Okay. I can feel confident uh, on the trend, in fact. And so these fiscal stimulus are important uh, in themselves, but also to improve the confidence of all economic uh, actors. Eve, thank you so much for joining us virtually. Uh, the next time you come through my part of the world, it's an open invitation to uh, Yves Perrier the CEO of Amundi. Sir, we wish you well, stay safe. I hope you get everybody back to work and we all get back to some kind of whatever the new normal is very soon. Merci beaucoup et à bientôt. So that is the CEO of Amundi. Uh, Joining us for a great conversation in terms of how to allocate capital and the risks. The BI team are busy, are busy. Bloomberg Intelligence. We've got Matthew Bloxham and Julie uh, Chariel on the topic of COVID-19 accelerating the digital transformation. Let's take a listen. Hello, my name is Matthew Bloxham. I'm the lead for technology, media, and telecom research for Bloomberg Intelligence for the EMEA region. Now, work from home has clearly exploded um, through the pandemic lockdowns, uh, but really the opportunity for technology companies depends on where it settles as restrictions ease. Uh, and to understand that potential, um, we've looked at some data um, that's made available by Eurostat, which is the Statistics Bureau of the European Commission. Uh, and what you can see in this chart um, is the proportion of the workforce that historically has worked from home uh, and the kind of opportunity set as we see it for where that could go uh, in the longer term. And essentially we see that potentially work from home uh, could double from its historic levels going forward. Now what you can see that the, the blue bars show you the percentage of the labour force in Europe uh, that historically has been working from home. The dark blue bars represent people that work from home or that their home is their usual place of work and the light blue bars 
uh, represents the, the labour force um, who occasionally work from home. Uh, now together that adds up to about 16% uh, of the total European workforce, about 5% usually work from home, another 11% occasionally work from home. Now the yellow markers represent what we see uh, as the opportunity set uh, for work from home going forward and that essentially represents the proportion of the labour force uh, that works in service industries that we see as um, kind of conducive to working from home uh, and what we see for Europe as a whole is that that opportunity set could be 30% of the labour force so roughly double the historic average but that the spread is quite different across European countries. You can see on the left hand side of this chart that countries like Sweden and the Netherlands uh, are already operating at a level that's quite close to that kind of maximum opportunity set. But then you see countries like Norway, which is about two thirds of the way to the right, where current uh, historic levels of work from home are a long way below the opportunity set. Um, so, and actually what's quite interesting is that for the big European markets, so the UK, Germany, France, uh, Italy and Spain, there's also quite a substantial upside potential there if working practices do shift um, as lockdowns ease. And that could be a great opportunity for technology companies in the region. Now, how close we get to that maximum potential depends very much uh, on how uh, employers shift their work from home policies. We've seen that Twitter um, and Facebook have taken the lead globally in, in how they're offering their staff the opportunity to work from home permanently, but we have started to see similar moves from big European companies. For example, Barclays and WPP, the ad agency, their CEOs have both acknowledged that there's going to be a permanent shift in how people work going forward. Uh, and we've seen Telenor, the Norwegian telecom carrier, offer its uh, employees opportunities to permanently work from home going forward. So the shifts are happening. So we will definitely, I think, see uh, that historic average of kind of 16% 6, or so go up uh, and it could quite easily get into the 20 to 30% range, which creates quite a substantial opportunity for technology companies in Europe. So the digital transformation opportunities for the technology sector in Europe um, really enabled by work from home uh, but that kind of work from home opportunity is only really enabled um, if home broadband connections are working well. Now there were definitely con some concerns in Europe um, when lockdowns first kicked in that the networks might not be able to cope with the additional demands being made of them uh, and we saw moves for example to ask Netflix and other streaming platforms to cut uh, their streaming throughput by about 25% to help protect networks so people could work from home effectively. Uh, and I think since then, actually, there's been very few incidents uh, of network problems reported across the region. Uh, but we thought it'd be interesting to kind of dig a little bit deeper and see what the home broadband experience has been for people at an individual level. And to do that, uh, we carried out a survey of London-based staff of Bloomberg, um, who are typically quite intensive users of home broadband connections, to see how their experience had been. And the results of that survey were quite interesting. Now about 575 people took part in the survey um, and we found that overall 80% uh, of respondents were either somewhat or very satisfied with how their home broadband connection had performed during lockdown in the UK. And that's despite the fact that 62% of those respondents said they'd experienced some issues uh, with their connection during lockdown. Now those issues were typically either slow speeds um, or unstable connections, but overall they weren't kind of substantial enough to kind of detract from people's uh, perception uh, of the experience they were getting. But you know, we did see that there's a kind of um, a significant minority of people who've been frustrated enough by the home broadband experience to consider switching uh, provider. About 26% of the respondents said that they were either considering or planning to switch provider as a result of their home broadband experience in lockdown. And we found that typically people were more inclined to think about switching if they had a slow broadband connection. So typically a connection that was below 20 megabytes megabits per second. Uh, we also saw, I think linked to that, that about 28% of respondents said that they were planning to up 
upgrade the speed of the connection they had either with their current or a new provider. Um, so that's kind of encouraging, I think, for the sales opportunity within the telecom industry. Uh, what was quite interesting too uh, was the Hyper Optic, which is a niche full fibre only provider in the UK, had by far and away the most satisfied users within our survey. And again, I think that's kind of reassuring and kind of underpins uh, this shift towards full fibre we're seeing. So I think overall for the industry, it's quite reassuring for telecom carriers who are investing billions of dollars as we speak in these new expensive full fibre networks that there's definitely as a result of the lockdown experience, um, a growing shift towards upgrading to faster connections, which are more expensive, so will generate more revenue for the industry, and that will in turn help to pay and accelerate the payback uh, on these expensive new networks that are going into the ground across Europe as we speak. So I hope that's been an interesting insight into the work we've been doing here in, in London. Um, you can contact me, Matthew Bloxham, via the terminal, and you can find out more about our research at BIGO. Thank you. That's Matt and the whole BI team right away across industries. Um, next guest, there's a thing or two about setting up tech, technology, businesses, and uh, how to navigate Africa. I'd like to welcome Mo Abraham. He's the founder and the chair of the Mo Abraham Foundation. Mo, it's been a few years, so it's, it's good to have you with us. Um, great to reconnect. Give me your impression of where we are in the African, pan-African response to COVID-19. Give, give, give me a sense of, of how it's been handled. Good day to you, sir. Right. Uh, well, first, thank you for having me. Uh, so far, things uh, look reasonable. We are carefully or cautiously optimistic. Um, uh, Africa is very much behind the curve. The Africa leaders show maturity in uh, responding very quickly early on. Uh, mm -hmm. The numbers actually are very low, very low, and we don't understand why. Of course, we are pleased our role, but we don't understand why. People give various reasons. Young population, uh, some resilience because of exposure to previous uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, you know, as, as, as a continent of young people, maybe. We, we really uh, don't understand. I mean, there are about 300,000 cases in Africa today. One third of them is in uh, two countries, uh, South Africa uh, and Egypt, yeah. almost one third of them. So things have gone reasonably well so far, but we hope that it will stay as such. We will not see really uh, a continuous rise in the number. Uh, WHO warns that worse may come. We hope that it not ha doesn't happen. Well, those those two countries, Mo, those two countries are incredibly important to to the success, uh, the overall success of Africa as a whole, and indeed to those very near countries in the north and and the south. If I look at the numbers, yes. the debt service numbers for Africa this year, Mo, they're going to come in at fourteen billion dollars. You and I chatted about this, and you said, Manus, there needs to be both private and public debt uh, forgiveness, I suppose, is the word that you use. So can put, put context around that, Mo. Yes. How and where, what pace of debt forgiveness do we need to see? Right. I mean, what worries me, really, more than the epidemic itself, is really the economic consequences of the epidemic. Uh, because <sighs> it's, 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 uh, it's a major problem uh, for us. Uh, uh, we, 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 I mean, the, 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 the tourism industry is totally shut down, hotels, uh, mm. uh, travel, etc. transport is a major economic hit uh, for Africa. Of course, uh, all the minerals, etc. they're just sitting there in the ground. So the economic hit is, is really bad for Africa. And the problem we have is that unlike the developed countries, which managed to marshal huge amount of funds to help citizens stay at home and 
I'll send you your salary at home. Uh, businesses, we're going to help you. Uh, we're going to pay uh, salaries for workers. So, you know, they don't dismiss them. African countries doesn't have the fis- you know the fiscal space in order to really support uh, uh, such financial incentives. So we're very. But then, do you believe the multi? Do you believe that the multilateral organisations are responding quickly enough and in enough size? Uh, no, no. Uh, there's a lot of goodwill. I must say, there's a lot of goodwill. But it's, it's, well, where is the beef? I mean, we, we we hear a lot of good intentions, but we're really waiting for the IMF to deploy this very powerful tool they have, which is the SDRs. Special drawing rights. They can they can issue up to six hundred billion dollars without a problem, and they have done that before. Uh, that that needs to be done, and uh, people should be you know poor countries should be able to borrow some of the rights of of of, of drawing rights of. Uh, and what do you think the obstacle to that is? Why 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 has that been slow to deploy? What, what's the obstacle? Well, look, I think I think the the global order is is. A, is, is uh, really, unfortunately, is not functioning well. And instead of coming together as a global community to face a global uh, uh, problem, a global ep- epidemic, we see sniping mm. between the major powers, and, and uh, uh, it's really unhelpful. It's unhelpful. Uh, we need to move forward with more resilience, and uh, we have to understand you know, as people, we live together. We cannot defeat this virus in Europe if we don't defeat it in Africa. That's what the European leaders said in the famous uh, call for action with the joint the African leaders. And they said, look, we can, victory can only be declared when we manage to, you know, sort out the epidemic in, in Africa. Uh, so, but do you think that's not been delivered? Do you think that's just rich on words from Europe and lack of delivery, or rich on words from other nations and lack of delivery? Who, who's Africa going to get? Who's Africa going to get the dollars from? If it's not the IMF, where's the money going to come from? Uh, it is a, <laughs> G20 offered some relief. Uh, we have yep. about forty-four billion dollars of interest to be paid this year. And uh, they offer some relief, but that's for the public debt. And that relief only for one year. It needs to be extended for two or three years. The private debt... So it's an extent on the public debt, but what about the private debt then, for people like you? Right. Uh, I mean, I hear today that the IMF is uh, allocating, uh, that the World Bank allocating $5 billion to help. I mean, that is a drop in the ocean, but they're trying to leverage. Uh, 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 their money with other uh, insurers, etc., to help the private sector. We need more support to the private sector because it's under extreme pressure, and uh, we need the private sector because that is what generates jobs, and uh, it's important to protect the jobs. If we fail to do that, we're going to have a major problem with young people, and where young people go when when there is no hope, there is no jobs, they go. They go into terrorism, they go into anarchy, they go, they die in, in the Mediterranean trying to migrate to Europe. That's something unacceptable. We really need to... Are we underestimating uh, that know, risk, uh, Mo? Mo? Are we underestimating yeah. that risk? Are we underestimating yes. that yes. risk of civil unrest from yes. youth? Yes, yes we, we are really underestimating that. And if you notice, all these terrorist groups are actually escalating their action because countries are distracted by the uh, epidemic. And we see a lot of problems in Burkina Faso, in Mali, etc. So we, not, we have to be careful. But that frightens capital uh, away. That, that actually do. frightens yeah. capital and investors away, Mo, doesn't it? Uh, not really. I mean, the, 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 no? the problems of, of terrorism or, or it is, it is happening in, 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 in the Sahel, in, in areas where there is not much industry or support, etc. By definition, actually, okay. because there is lack of jobs. Okay. Yeah. We've, we've got a few minutes. We've got a couple of minutes left. So I want to try and sort of get through a few things as quickly as I can. I, I want to turn commercial. I want to turn the, the discussion to opportunities mode. 
Every child is being schooled at home. Not every child is being schooled equally. Is Where are the biggest opportunities for you? You look across the disrupted landscape. Talk me through the biggest opportunities, Mo, as we come out of COVID. Uh, yes, there's a number of great opportunities. I mean, you take online education. Suddenly, our eyes have been opened that quality education can be delivered online. We have been forced to do that. And I see in, in the context of Africa where education is a problem, uh, that can be a great uh, 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 opportunity going forward. Definitely, online education is a great uh, uh, op opportunity. Uh, food and agriculture value chain. Uh, suddenly, be uh, the issue. It's not about food. And the, the need now to to, to stimulate uh, local food production and food delivery, transport, etc. So we see a great opportunity will be have will happen in the food and agriculture value chain. Uh, electronic payments. Now we are getting uh, well. Africa actually have been doing that for some time, but I think larger number of people now uh, can see the importance of uh, electronic payments. I mean, these are some examples uh, where I see uh, some great opportunities in Africa. Mo, the next time I see you, I think I saw you in London a few years ago. Yeah. So hopefully the next time we get together, um, maybe I'll be in Africa. Maybe, maybe Emirates will let me get on a plane. Let's see. Uh, Mo Abraham, the uh, founder. <laughs> Mo, thank you so much. Uh, it, it really is great to have you with us. This is day three, uh, of course, in Best Global here. Um, and it's been great conversations from the instigator and architect of the African Free Trade Agreement, Mo Abraham, there uh, on the opportunities within Africa and the Amundi CEO. Everybody get ready to go back to work. At a Monday, but you will have flexibility. Uh, and in terms of credit markets, they might have run a little bit too far. Um, I want to thank you. I hope you've enjoyed the discussions. Certainly, we've had Q and A throughout. I'd also like to like like to thank Echo Bank uh, for our spon the sponsorship here in the Middle East track, the Middle East time zone, and Africa, um, for helping make all of this possible for us. You want to stay tuned because it continues. I promised you. Asia, Middle East, Africa, and America. And that is what you get. Day three. Uh, the London sessions begin at 1 p.m. Um, I got my colleagues, Eric, Eric Schatzker, Jason's Kelly, Jason Kelly. They're also going to host some sessions as well. You can go to the event hub. It is the Bloomberg Invest Global Hub. You got the recap, the videos there. You can pick up the conversations, listen in to any part of them. Bloomberg Intelligence data, the resources. You see the whole team throughout three days delivering uh, information from Bloomberg Intelligence, um, who are also our data and resources for our sponsors. You can follow us at Bloomberg Live on Twitter, on LinkedIn for the updates, and you can also be sure to follow us for ongoing financial markets coverage at business on Bloomberg.com. And if you haven't already, consider a subscription, Bloomberg.com subscriptions from the Middle East and our headquarters here in Dubai. I'm Manis Cranny for Bloomberg. Global, invest, global, this is Bloomberg.